to welcome the PSAS flight controller team to PDX Rust. Hello, uh, my name is Brian and I'm here to talk about the Portland State capstone project for the CS group. Uh, we did a project for PSAS. Uh, I'm going to get into all what that means in a minute. Just let, every, uh, let everybody know, every time I talk it seems to be a while since the last time I've talked, so I'm going to trip over a bunch of words, so I apologize ahead of time for that. Um, but let's go ahead and get right into it. So let's start off with what is a capstone. So a capstone is a group project. It's going to be a group project based on our field of study, so computer science in our case. We did this out of Portland State University uh, with sponsors from outside of the class. So somebody from sometimes within the organization, sometimes within PSU, but oftentimes outside of the the school altogether will come in and they want to build something awesome. They want, uh, they need a tool built. They need to expand some features on another product, and they come in with a, with a specification and an idea in mind. And our job is to build whatever they wanted, but really go through the formal process of all of the software engineering steps and all of the software methodology <coughs> that one might theoretically use in the real world. Uh, so who is PSAS? PSAS is the Portland State Aerospace Society, uh, and they uh, are a team of students that build rockets, uh, which is pretty cool. You don't usually get to say at a student level that you build rockets or you work on rockets. Um, they do this at a very low cost. Uh, they have to do things like build their own Wi-Fi because they can't afford uh, GPS, the type of GPS that would go into commercial grade rockets. Uh, all of their code is open source online, as well as all of their hardware designs. So if you're following PSAS, you can go on, see how they've built everything, and uh, if you have the money, actually build one yourself, which is kind of cool. Uh, and the, their eventual goal is to put a satellite into orbit, uh, which is a very tall order. It's definitely not something that you do uh, overnight. So PSAS has a challenge, and this is what they came to the capstone with. Uh, they want to be able to fly in space. All of their previous rockets uh, flew in the atmosphere, and you can use fins for that, or uh, wings or anything that you know works in the atmosphere. In space, none of that works, so they needed to rebuild their flight controller. Uh, they had enough changes they wanted to make, they decided they wanted to rebuild it, but they also had enough changes uh, in this new language called Rust was coming along. They, they wanted to try that out. Uh, so what does this new flight controller need? It needed to use cold, jet, cold gas jets. It also needed to be testable so that they can run tests on laptops instead of constantly using rockets to test sort of flight mode. Uh, it needs to be fast. It also needs to be safe. You don't want your code crashing in the middle of a flight or when it's trying to make a turn or doing something critical. So the decision that PSAS made was that they were going to use this product called JSB Sim to simulate physics on the laptop so that they can do mimic, mimicked flights uh, without ever having to take off. Uh, to be fast and safe, they decided to use the Rust language. And they needed to be able to read and write for these cold gas jets using these libraries called I2C and GPIO, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So these tools were complicated. Uh, we were all undergraduate. We were all undergraduate CS majors. We didn't know how to use these tools. We didn't know a lot about hardware. Uh, some of our group members had a little bit of experience in that, actually, because they worked in the field before coming back to school. So we had a lot to catch up on. We had a lot to learn before even writing the first bit of Rust code, including learning Rust itself. Uh, I had a little bit of familiarity with it before we started, and I think one other group member might have heard of it. Uh, so it was a new enough language that we actually had to learn that. From, from scratch. Uh, so we built a minimum viable product that compiles in flight mode and test mode. I'll talk about why that uh, needed to happen in a second. Um, it integrates with these two libraries, uh, and it integrates with the simulation software JSP Sim. So to test it, we were given an LED prototype, which I have some videos about. Uh, and integrating with JSP Sim, we were able to test our flight mode or our test mode. Uh, locally on a laptop. So let's talk a little bit. Let's go into PSAS. So this is PSAS's most recent launch. And launch. It's one of my favorite videos for launch 12. 
So this is what the current rocket looks like. As you can see, it's got fins. It's doing a little tail spin thing, which we can talk about later. And overall, it seems to go off without a hitch. This launch didn't have any problems. Uh, <laughs> that's true if we want to watch all the way until the camera falls out, actually. Yeah, there's actually, I'll link to all their, their YouTube videos. There's quite a few just on this launch. And if you get motion sick from watching videos, now is the time to look away. <laughs> I'll pause it right there. Um, so they have this prototype system, and I would have loved to say that we got a chance to run on this, but it, uh, by the time we were done with the code, uh, it actually had some repairs that needed to happen, so we couldn't actually run on this at the time. Uh, I have videos of the LED prototype we ran on. But this is sort of the future, what their future rocket's going to look like. Um, up here, we have, they have these things, these little rocket nozzles shooting cold gas jets out. We've got the compressed air down here. And this is a prototype they built. They wrote this in Python. And all it does is keep rotation stable. And this is sort of what we had to mimic in Rust using all these other libraries. <clears throat> so like I said, I really wish you could have run on it, but uh, we did not get the chance. So jumping into the, actually I'll do this with the mouse. Jumping into the uh, folder breakdown, we have our a common, inside of our, our main source folder, we have a common folder, a flight mode folder, and a test mode folder. Uh, so one of the primary requirements was that PSAS wanted to be able to compile the flight mode and test mode uh, targets independently, because they didn't want some software trigger to like accidentally turn the flight mode while the rocket was flying into test mode, stop working on the rocket itself, and start producing JSP send output while in flight. So at compile time, they wanted to make sure absolutely that they were not going to run JSP sim code. The easiest way to do this, uh, it's not the only way to do it, but the easiest way to do this was to break down flight mode and test mode specific code into their own directories below our common directory, or actually next to the common directory, and then have it reference the common directory for the main program, the main flight software, uh, and actually data formatter as well. We needed to work with custom UDP packets that PSAS had designed so that we can send telemetry data back down to the ground. Uh, we needed to do this because this is part of, uh, I'm referencing Jamie back there, uh, this is part of the, <laughs> it's too expensive to buy commercial GPSs for rockets, so you had to build your own. Oh, I'm sorry, that was separate. <laughs> Uh, yeah, th there's limited bandwidth that we have available for sending telemetry to the ground, and we have a lot we want to get sent down to the ground. So we uh, devised a custom lightweight binary protocol uh, specifically for the stuff we needed to send. Okay, I remember that now. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into some interesting statistics about our code. Uh, there is 651 lines of actual Rust code, so that doesn't include white space for comments or anything. All, all together combined, there's 1,000 lines. Uh, there's 43 lines of C++, and I said CPP because the software I was using to make this presentation didn't like two plus signs together. It just sort of deleted the slide. So <laughs> it's, it's CPP instead. Um, and this is mostly because we had to talk to JSP Sim, which is, an entirely, which is entirely written in C++. Uh, it also has 668 lines of markdown documentation, uh, which is good. It's a slightly more documentation than we have code. Uh, some of it is useful. Some of it was really just to jump through hoops for the capstone project. So some interesting problems that we had uh, when, when working on this. JSP Sim is a really hard tool to work with. Um, it's virtually undocumented. Uh, as I said, it was written in C++, uh, and it kind of has spaghetti code. I had... Uh, we had two people working on just this piece of it. And it took the entire six months of our project to come up with the proof of concept that we needed to build an actual testable, runnable uh, simulation. Really, really a, a pain in the butt. Um, our 
Compiling in, in different modes, the, the way we solved that, as I previously stated, probably wasn't the only way to solve it. There's probably other ways to do that too. But this is the one that we found was the easiest to do. It didn't require building make files. It didn't require you know, any code configuration. It just required you to be in the right directory when you compiled at the right time. So it seems like the simplest way to, to do it, but it's certainly not the only way. Some interesting bugs that we came across. Two bugs and I have two videos to show you. So our counterclockwise bias, which was uh, the fact that the LED board, based on temperature and slight variations of uh, and where it might be sitting in, on the axis at any point in time, its zero point wasn't actually zero. <coughs> and then we actually had a dual spin bug. I'm going to show both of these off. So this first bug was, I should probably explain this a little bit. So the rate of LED blinking uh, was just set on a timer. So if we detected that we had you know, a plus blink green, if we detected a minus blink red, and it blinks in the opposite direction that the uh, rocket, if you can imagine this being a piece of a rocket sort of lengthwise, uh, where the cold gas jets would light up, the cold gas jets would accelerate in the direction that the lights were going in the opposite of the direction. What you'll notice here is that the Hmm. I did not actually get on the Wi-Fi. Can we pause this really quick? Sorry about that. Uh, so you'll notice that I think we have a bias in the red direction. Red is blinking nice and consistently. Green is blinking, but it kind of doesn't blink all the time. So we have a, a bias, which means that the center of this rocket is not actually the center. Once we fix that code, we, you can see here that no bias, it seems to be working fine. We fixed this a couple of different ways. The first way we fixed this was just to manually input what we saw was the average bias, and that got us going along for a little while. And then later we uh, actually wrote the, rewrote that piece of the program to find an average of what the rocket was, uh, or what the gyroscope was reading, set that as a bias, and applied that to all of our readings. And that worked out much better and works even if there's a, a big enough change that your bias is uh, isn't consistent. The next bug we come across, we came across, was this dual spin bug. If you sort of shook the controller back and forth, you can get both lights to go on at the same time, which you can see right there. And that should never happen. So if the rocket is experiencing some sort of jiggle and both of them are going off at the same time, it's not doing anything productive. It's wasting gas, but it's also uh, potentially just going to throw your rocket uh, out of whack. Uh, we did end up fixing that bug, and this is actually what it looks like. So to actually explain here, when we first run the program, it takes a couple of seconds to figure out what that bias is, and then it starts running, and it just dumps to the screen all of the, uh, all of the gyro data. Then we're going to do a little back and forth on the prototype, so the prototype is going to show us red and green lights, and then we're going to come back to the screen where we've loaded up the telemetry viewer, which is that, uh, the UDP packets, and you can see that, that it's working. And that was our final product. That took about six months to do. Um, of course, taking into account that we all had to learn Rust, all of these libraries, and a bunch of mechanical work. Um, but uh, we feel pretty good about it, and, and we're pretty happy that we got to that stage. Oh, and that was the Watch It Work slide. I already did that. So code time. So let's go ahead and jump into what the code actually looks like. And now these microphones make more sense to use. So over on the left side here, we have the common directory, the flight mode directory, and the test mode directory. Now, the files I showed you before was just a subset of the files. There's a whole lot more in here. For example, all of our JSP SIM integration stuff, all of these work off of UXML, but it's an old program. That is what it is. Uh, we have some CMake files in here. We have some C++ wrapper files uh, to get, we needed to use, we need to 
to run the Rust code that will actually run C++ code, in order to go all the way down to JSP Sim, we actually had to write uh, a, a Rust wrapper. And uh, as you can see, I didn't actually write this or else all of the line endings would not be showing. Oh, that's actually a good point. Sorry about that. Uh, Yeah, that'll work. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. Sorry No, thank you. So we have a uh, Rust wrapper that calls C++ wrappers, and that is below our Rust code and above the JSP SIM code. Uh, so it takes a little bit to get JSP SIM integrated with Rust, um, but fortunately we actually were able to do it. Um, I2C and GPIO, I'm not going to dive into too much because I don't have enough time to talk about deeply what they are, but we basically had to wrap them up in our own Rust structs and call them internally. Uh, in flight mode, so the best way to explain this is the common code, which is like where our main program is, is going to load up these I2C and GPIO interfaces and start talking to them. But in our flight mode, we need them to talk to hardware. And in test mode, we need them to interact with JSP SIM. So we had to write wrappers between those. And on the JSP SIM side, we had to write the Rust and the C++ wrapper. But we had to write our own modules in between those uh, that had consistent, for example, um, implementations on those structs, functions that we, we implemented ourselves. So for example, we have in flight mode, GPIO, we have the my pins struct, and in the test mode GPIO, we have the my pin struct, <laughs> and this only works because we're compiling them uh, to different. One of these GPIOs is being compiled at a time, um, or else we'd have some weird conflicts. Uh, and we didn't do anything super crazy with our Rust code. We tried to keep it pretty simple. Uh, that's also pretty much the only Rust we knew. Um, <laughs> We, I, was, I was actually pretty happy that I got the team to use results and options instead of uh, just returning um, integers that had error codes attached to them like you would do in C. Um, a couple of our programmers were old school C programmers, so they sort of mimicked what they were doing on the C side, um, which isn't really idiomatic rust. Um, it works, but I wanted to get everybody to use the correct sort of idiomatic way of doing things. Um, there's a lot of code to go through. Like I said, there's over 600 lines, so I'm not going to be able to touch all of it. But this is all on GitHub uh, there. And uh, the Rocket videos I showed you were there. And I think I am ready for questions. OK. Um. So we are recording, so I will pass you a mic if you have questions. Uh, so did you consider, uh, so you had some kind of like duplicated types, uh, for one for the test and then one for the real thing. Did you consider putting all of that into a trait and, and then just requiring, having your common code require something that implements the trait? We started talking about traits and how to implement those. And at the time that we were designing it, we didn't know enough about traits. Mm -hmm. uh, when we Sort of retro speaking, looking back on it, I probably would have done something like that. I would have designed it with more of a trait system. Uh, but we still needed to keep our code separate, or else we needed some really complicated make file uh, to make it all work. So we, we still kind of needed to implement everything twice on the some level. Um, uh, I'm not terribly familiar with uh, Rust, but is there any like checks for integer overflow and underflow? Integer and overflow and underflow. Uh, I, I, I'm not actually sure about that. I haven't written Rust in a little while. We'll about that in the next talk. That's true. The next talk will have a lot of the answer. The TLDR is by default in debug mode. It will check and not release mode. But then there are options to change that or to use it in specific cases. Okay, any other questions for the flight controller team?
I really wish I could actually show you, uh, show you and actually work on this laptop, but this is not the laptop I developed on. This is my work laptop, and uh, it was just last minute. My laptop wasn't working properly, um, but we did get all of it to run. I, I have the videos of it, and uh, so long as you have JSP Sim installed properly, you can actually get this to run as a laptop. Too. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you.